Good evening. Uh, my name is Martin O'Reilly, as you've just heard, and uh, I've been in Dublin Fire Brigade uh, for the last 24 years. And before you <coughs> ask, I, I went straight from primary school into. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to give you a little insight into, first to start off with a bit of history. Uh, last year, we proudly uh, celebrated 150 years in existence in Dublin Fire Brigade. We, we were created in 1864, and uh, we've been in existence through many of the, the highlights of history that the state has had from uh, 1916 to the emergency, uh, on to the, the Dublin Monaghan bombings and uh, the Stardust. Um, so we've been around for, uh, for quite a while. Um, in fact, we're the old, oldest uniform body in the state. Uh, but we have a baby brother as such in our ambulance service, which was established in 1898. And apparently at the time in Dublin, we had tremendous amount of road traffic accidents, obviously from horses and carts and not motorised vehicles. And we had the worst record for, for road traffic accidents in the British Isles at the time. And uh, in the papers in the 1895s, there was outrage as why Dublin didn't have uh, an ambulance service to bring patients to hospital. Because at that time, patients were just brought by any means on the back of a cart or any means at all po that they had available to them. And uh, it was said that all of the finest cities in the kingdom had an ambulance service and why hadn't we? So the chief fire officer was a man <laughs> called Captain uh, Purcell and he designed the very first ambulance in Ireland. And the photo that you see in front of you there is an exact replica of that ambulance that he designed back in 1898. And uh, it had inside it two stretchers, some splints and some bandages. And he sent off 10 firefighters from Central Fire Station, which was located where Tower Street, Pier Street is at the moment. We have a fire station still on the site to train with a doctor uh, in first aid so that they'd be ready for when the ambulance was finished. And uh, so they trained away, the ambulance arrived uh, at the end of 1898, and an advertisement appeared in the local paper on the 5th of January 1899, advertising the fact that we now had an ambulance to bring people to hospital. And there was a, a fee apparently of one pound for a private residence and free of charge for anybody that'd be knocked down on the streets at the time. So in its first year, it had uh, 575 calls uh, for, its, for its help. And so began the first ambulance service in the country, the Dublin Fire Brigade Ambulance Service. So that's a little bit of the history. At that time, the first aid training took about, I think, six weeks. <coughs> um, Moving on to nearer in time, we now have a, a training institute. We're partnered with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and our training institute is called the DFB RCSI Training Institute. It's located out in Marino, and we're a pre-hospital emergency care council, or FEC, you can see there the acronym, accredited institute. Yeah, it's an unfortunate <laughs> abbreviation, but we're a FEC accredited institute for the provision of emergency medical courses in Ireland. And uh, we teach right from very simplest standard, which would be CPR and the use of a defibrillator, right up to paramedic training uh, at that site. In order to work as an emergency ambulance person in Ireland, in order to work on an ambulance, the minimal level of training is paramedic and the training program takes approximately two years to complete and our students are awarded a diploma from the Royal College of Surgeons on completion of their training program. Uh, there is a higher level of training called Advanced Paramedic which is a two-year graduate diploma and in order to go on to that program you have to have a minimum of about three years experience at paramedic level. 
Um, I suppose if you were to think of uh, equated to international standards, an advanced paramedic would be very similar to an American paramedic, and <coughs> our paramedic standard would be a little bit higher than an American emergency medical technician, uh, if you were to think on, on uh, to try and compare it internationally. So. so this is our area of operation, the entire city and county of Dublin. It, uh, we serve 1.2 million people who live in that area, approximately half a million households. But obviously there's an influx of people who come into the city to work every day and visitors to our city. So we get very busy between the, the times of 7 a.m. to about 2 a.m. every day. And it, it's, it, it spikes in the afternoon. And then after 2 a.m. it kind of falls off and 7 a.m. it starts back up again. And that's Monday to Friday. Saturday nights and Sunday nights it goes on a little bit later. We stay busy for up to maybe three, four o'clock in the morning. And then it, it eases off a little. So we provide a fully integrated fire-based ambulance and EMS service. And what does that mean? Well, all of our staff, all firefighters are trained to be firefighters and paramedics. So they operate on fire appliances and ambulances, and they carry out their emergency medical work while they're on both of those vehicles. They interchange between them on a daily basis, and uh, they're providing care 24-7. Um, we, we get about 90,000 phone calls every year to our control centre for help from the public for ambulance services. And these 90,000 phone calls equate to about 72,000 individual incidents. So if you could imagine that, for instance, the Lewis crash on O'Connell Street was what we call one incident, but it had many phone calls. So many calls for that type of incident. And we sent an awful lot of vehicles to that, and we would call them mobilizations. So we sent lots of fire engines and lots of ambulances to that incident. So 90,000 phone calls for help, 72,000 individual incidents in 2011, and 93,000 uh, mobilizations. The, our fire appliances attend about 12,000 incidents annually. Um, and we'll go on to talk about the specific type of calls that we send the different vehicles to as we continue on. In the picture there, you can see one of our ambulances, and uh, on, the, on the lower picture there is our advanced paramedic response car, which you probably see if you live around the city, particularly the inner city, you'll see that, and you would have seen it a lot over the last six weeks or so. So when the calls come into our control centre, which is located in Town's End Street, in Tower Street, we take the 999 calls for emergency medical response and fire calls for the entire eastern seaboard in that control centre. Um, it's important that we have a quality system for taking calls and we extract all the vital information that we can from the caller in order to determine what exactly is wrong and how we should respond to the emergency. So we obviously need the location and the nature of the incident, but we need more information to determine the priority and we use a system called medical priority dispatch system, which is a series of questions that the caller is asked, and depending on the answer to each question, feeds on to another question and so on and so forth, and eventually by the time they're finished, they have categorized your emergency call into an order of priority from very, very serious to perhaps the not so serious down the end. So a right range of it. Now, the reason why we do this is because resources need to be used efficiently when we're talking about people's lives, when we're talking about life and death, and we need to make sure we have the right category <coughs> response and to provide the right response to the patient and the nearest appropriate resource. Now, Paul is going to give you an idea about the types of incidents that we attend now for the next little while, and when Paul is finished, I'll just talk a little bit more about the right response in a particular category of call 
that we deal with. Thank you. Okay. So one good thing about our uh, combined fire EMS system is, is that our fire stations are very strategically located around the city, which means that our response time for fire calls is about eight minutes to ensure that we don't get fire development very, very quickly and we can knock the fire down. But also, the ambulance response time, usually we can get to a life-threatening situation within eight minutes from throughout the city and that's because of the geographic location of our stations. Um, we do run a 24-7 service, so it means that all our appliances, well, with, we have a couple of retained appliances as well in the North County, but most of our appliances are on a 24-7 basis. In other words, we're not on call. As soon as you make your call, you look for an emergency service, we turn out and we come to help you. Okay, so we're not on page or system. We're lucky enough that we can, we're in the station all the time and we're, we're there hopefully within the eight minutes when you need us. Okay. Martin sa as Martin said, we do prioritise our calls. So sometimes if we don't think a call is as emergent as another one, we can take a little bit more time to get there. But if it's a life-threatening situation, we're there as soon as we can. And the good thing about it is that we can send out the fire appliance first and the ambulance may get there a little bit later or sometimes the ambulance there first and then the fire, fire engine a little bit later. Okay. A great thing about a combined EMS service is, is that we have plenty of resources. So when we arrive to, let's say, a cardiac arrest or a road traffic accident, it means that we don't just have two paramedics come off an ambulance, we have seven paramedics because we'd have five on the fire appliance and two on the ambulance, which means that many hands make light work so we can really help reduce the on-scene time and get people to hospital where they can be treated properly. Okay. We do always do our initial assessment, our ABC, or what we call our initial patient assessment is basically where we assess the airway, the breathing, the circulation, treat any life-threatening bleeds or injuries, and make interventions there and then, and then we transport. Okay. Another good thing about a combined EMS service is is that we have plenty of equipment available. So if you're trapped in a car somewhere and you get a fire engine response, it means that we have the equipment to stabilize the vehicle and then take the vehicle away from the patient safely. We cut the car away from the patient, basically, and then we can manage the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. And so basically, another, another um, good thing about it is because we have plenty of bodies on scene, we help with safety. And that's a big thing. I don't know if you heard a couple of years back there was a guard and the firefighters in the country killed at a road traffic accident. So one good thing about our appliances is we, when we arrive on scene, we have plenty of bodies and we use our appliances in a fend-off position. So we block the road off completely and we create a safe working environment for our personnel and ultimately for the patients we're dealing with as well. Um, Dublin Fire Brigade also offers um, some specialist rescue techniques. Um, not so much nowadays, but a couple of years ago, what did we see across the city line? Plenty of uh, high-line cranes. And a lot of the times, like, the workers in those cranes have to climb up there first thing in the morning. They stay up there for a few hours. And the odd time, they might get chest pain or feel very unwell or maybe have a heart attack. So they have to be taken down very, very quickly. So we do have specialised teams where we can send up high-line rescue teams and they're also dual-trained paramedics. So not can they, they can't only just rescue the patient, they can start tr treatment as well. They can give the initial medications and drugs, they can monitor the patient's heart rate and they can stabilise them until we can get them down from the crane. Okay. So that's another good benefit of a combined EMS system. Um, we also have a lot of uh, water around Dublin City with canals, rivers, the Liffey. So all over Dublin, we've got some water risk. And we have what we call SRT teams, or swift water rescue teams. And every year, I think there's about uh, 127 incidents where our fire and ambulance services turn out to near drownings or people who are trapped under debris and water, or just people throwing themselves in the Liffey trying to commit suicide. And so we would go and be able to extricate them and then initiate care as well. So 
it's a, it's a good system to have where we can effect a rescue and start treatment straight away. Um, the type of incidents that, uh, or the type of conditions that we have to treat straight away when we take someone from the water, one would be hypothermia, in other words, where the patient's core temperature drops rapidly, very, very quickly. And the other would be a submersion type incident where they've been trapped under the water as well. So we have to be very careful how we actually treat somebody in that case. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail as we, as we move along. Right. So I don't know if anyone here has ever been in a road traffic accident. Any hands to show? Okay, so a couple of people. Quite common in Dublin, quite common in Ireland. And in around Dublin City, because of the location of the, the M50 around, we, we come across some high speed road traffic collisions as well. And it's one thing that uh, we always preach in Dublin Fire Brigade is, and it's on, the, it's on the telly all the time, that if you reduce your speed, you're going to reduce the amount of uh, damage done to somebody. Because if your injuries basically occur, not just by uh, somebody traveling at speed, but it's the sudden stop when they hit the tree and the tree jumps out in front of them. And it's the, it's the amount of kinetic energy or speed and the energy transfer that does all the damage. Now, thank God in, in this day and age, you've got a lot of uh, safe systems in cars. So we have airbag deployment, crumple zones, which help absorb energy. Like when I first started in the ambulance service, um, they hadn't got these things in vehicles. So a lot of patients that we went to would have had been scalped because they had to go through the windscreen. They'd have a horrific maxilla facial injuries. And nowadays, we don't tend to see that as much because of the, the new set safe systems in cars. Okay, so that's a, a great thing. But if we do come across a road traffic accident, we have a set system in, in managing that. The first thing we do is always make the area safe. We stabilize the vehicle. And we, as you can see in the uh, picture there on the top, the first picture on the top is that the black thing's under the wheel. And that's to stop any movement of the, of the car suspension. Because if somebody has a possible spinal injury as a result of a road traffic accident, greater than one millimeter of inappropriate movement could actually cause them to become paralyzed. So it's our job to make sure that we give them the best care to stabilize the vehicle, secure their, their neck using a collar, and then place them on a spinal board where they can't do any further damage. Okay. Our approach, though, is always, once we stabilize the car, we assess the patient. We assess initially if they're, if they're breathing adequately, if they have any major injuries. And if they don't, well, then we do what we call a rapid extrication. In other words, we put a collar on and we have them out of there. If any of their injuries are life-threatening, we extricate them from the car very, very quickly. But when we assess a patient and they're stable and they have good vital signs and their blood pressure is at a nice level and we're happy with their breathing rate and there's no particular injuries when we check them over from head to toe, well, then we can take our time. We remove the vehicle from around the car. We use the jaws of life, as you have heard of that before. So we have hydraulic cutting equipment. We take the roof off, we take the doors off, and then we put the patient on a, an extrication device for immobilizing from the cervical spine right down to the lumbar spine, and then slowly put them on a spinal board and make sure that they're treated safely. So it's a, we can actually extricate someone from a car within a couple of minutes, like literally from being on scene to having the patient assessed and packaged and off scene to hospital in under 10 minutes sometimes. And that's including taking the doors and the roof off. And that's down to good training and efficient teamwork as well, because we all, we work very well as part of a team in Dublin Fire Brigade. Okay. Another good thing about having us there is that if you are in a road traffic collision, that sometimes you'll have leakages of petrol, oil, other flammable fluids. And if you're talking about a risk of, you're talking about a risk of fire there as well, so if we have a fire tender or a fire engine there, we have a hose made down ready just in case the vehicle does go on fire. Okay. Right. So for different types of incidents we go to, we manage all kinds of different patients. And that's one very good thing about working for Dublin Fire Brigade as a paramedic, is that the range of calls we go to is immense. We go to everything from childbirth to somebody having cardiac chest pain, to trauma, shootings, all kinds of different things that we go to. And from day to day, you don't know what, 
what kind of calls you're going to be sent out to. So it's a very interesting type of job to have. Well, I, I find it very interesting and very rewarding as well. Some of the calls that we do that are life-threatening will be basic life support. So there are typical cardiac arrest calls. We get a call in our 999 system to say somebody's not breathing, they're not, no pulse, and they're an awful colour. So they're the initial kind of calls that we get. We'd arrive on scene and we'd start what we call basic life support. So I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, one of the most important things to do if somebody's in cardiac arrest where the heart has actually stopped is to start early CPR. And what the brain cells actually start to die within about four to six minutes of them going into cardiac arrest. So by starting early CPR, you're getting enough blood by pressing on the chest and compressing the heart, getting enough blood to the brain to, main, to stop the cells from dying. And that's vitally important. So everyone's trying to get the message out there for everyone in the community to learn how to do CPR and use a defibrillator as well. So that's our initial goal when we arrive on scene, is to assess someone's airway, breathing, circulation, start compressions, and then get a use of a defibrillator where we can shock somebody's heart. When somebody goes into cardiac arrest, most of the time their heart actually starts to quiver. Instead of going top bottom, top bottom, the heart starts to quiver irregularly, and it means it's not pumping effectively. So when we arrive on scene, we get a defibrillator, we put a pad here, another pad on the other side of the chest. We send a shock through the heart muscle in, in the hope that the heart stops all electrical activity and the heart's pacemaker starts off again at its own rate. Now the good thing about having a fire-based EMS system is, is that our, all our fire appliances carry defibrillators and all our ambulances carry defibrillators. So we can have a fire crew on scene and have a shock delivered and CPR being performed before the ambulance gets there. And, and that's the good thing about Dublin Fire Brigade, that we can have someone there and the initial life-threatening treatment started, started early. As Martin said, we also have Advanced Paramedics now pre-hospital. I don't know if you're aware of that. But Advanced Paramedics um, basically do a lot of the interventions that they do in the a and &E in hospital, only they can do it on scene and the earlier these interventions can be done, the better it can be for the patients. So the types of interventions we can do are we can put in advanced airways. We can put a breathing tube directly down into the, through the vocal cords. I'll show you a picture of that now in a minute. And it means then that the patient's getting 100% oxygen into the lungs, which is very beneficial if, if they're in cardiac arrest because we can really get good oxygenated blood flow to the brain. Um, we can also now put in get vascular access. In other words, you can put a needle in the arm and get uh, medications into the vein. Or the other way we do it now is we can put a needle into the knee, well, just below the kneecap. There's, we get what we call intraosseous access, where we put a, it's basically a screw gun and we screw directly into the bone. And it's very, the bones are very, very vascular, so we have medications for cardiac arrest given straight away. Okay? It's just a little point here called the midi, what's that, the, the medial aspect of the tibial tuberosity, and we just screw directly in there, and you've got access straight away. So a couple of years ago, we couldn't do that kind of stuff, but nowadays we can. We can give epinephrine for cardiac arrest, which basically increases the heart's ability to generate electrical impulse and the contractile force of the heart. We can give amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic drug, so if the heart muscle becomes irritable, it can stop the irritability, and it means that the heart is more receptive to, to a shock when we actually shock somebody. Okay. So all kinds of different uh, things have come on. We also deal with uh, acute coronary syndrome patients now pre-hospital. So in a couple of years' time when you're going to be having your heart attacks, okay, uh, I know that in the, in the last two weeks there's been great um, improvements in pre-hospital care for cardiac chest pain. So when I'm having my heart attack in 10 or 15 years' time, I'm happy with the system that's being put into place now. Because our guys in the ambulance now, what they actually do is they, they carry 12 lead ECGs. So if someone's having cardiac chest pain, they put a 12 lead ECG on and they can diagnose if their patient's having a heart attack and the location of the heart attack. In other words, what type of heart attack they're having. And nowadays, we don't bring them straight to the A&E anymore. We bypass the A&E and we go directly to the PPCI center. And all that means is it's a 
uh, percutaneous coronary intervention center and it's a primary one which means that it's available on a 24-7 basis. So if someone's having a heart attack, we can bring them directly to the cat lab where they can get the best treatment. They put a guide wire up into the heart, see where the blockage is, unblock it and put a stent in. So there's no more time wasted around the knee anymore where they have to then transfer you. So we bring it directly to where you get the best care. So that's something that's only happened in the last, since the, the end of last year and it's making improving patient outcomes. And I think that's the way pre-hospital treatment is going to be going in general, that they're going to have specialist centre. So if you have a stroke in the future, you'd be brought to a stroke centre. If you have a bad head injury, you'd be brought to a hospital with, that can deal with head, injury cap cap with head injuries, the likes of Beaumont, where they have specialist uh, imaging and, sp and basically they've got the neurosurgeons there as well. Okay. Other conditions that we can actually treat would be the likes of uh, glycemic emergencies. So if you're a diabetic patient um, and you have what we call a hypoglycemic event where your blood sugar drops right down, we can give you medications now. We can give you an intramuscular injection of glucagon, which can mobilize stores of sugar in your liver into a more usable form of glucose. And that can temporarily bring your sugar level up and then we can give you some oral glucose or glucose where you, you drink it. Okay, or squeeze it through a paste. So patients who are having glycemic emergencies now are treated much better pre-hospital. Or if you're having a hyperglycemic event where your sugar, blood sugar level is going very, very high, our advanced paramedicine come and put a needle in your arm and give you some fluids to help reduce your, the acidosis in your, in your body. So these are all much more improved treatments now that we're getting pre-hospital. Um, other patients we, might, we often come across will be seizure type patients. And if somebody's having a seizure, there's a couple of different things that we want to stop with seizure activity. Number one, they become hypoxic or their oxygen levels in the blood can start to drop if they're actively seizing because they're not getting enough oxygen with chest excursion. And number two, their, their brain can overheat a little bit. So we can now give anti-seizure medication to stop seizures and we give anticonvulsants that will relax the muscles and then we can manage somebody's airway and provide them with, with good oxygen delivery. Um, we can treat patients with inadequate respirations as well. And what I mean by that is any condition where it interferes with somebody's breathing. And that's quite prevalent in Dublin because we have a lot of heroin overdoses in Dublin. We're called to a lot of pharmaceutically gifted people who inject themselves. And that depresses the central nervous system. So we can now give the antidote to heroin, which is naloxone. And we can give that intramuscularly or into the muscle or directly into the vein now as well. And that can reverse the effect of an opiate overdose and get them to come back around breathing again. Other kind of emergencies that we do would be the likes of uh, asthmatic patients where they have a reaction to some kind of allergen and their airways start to close down we can now give nebulizers pre hospital to start to bronchodilate or open up the airways. And when it opens up the airways, it means they can breathe much easier. Okay. So um, they're the type of interventions that we, that we make pre hospital, the range. Um, for stroke patients as well, pre hospital, we identify pro, uh, stroke patients using what we call the FAST assessment. So you've probably seen the ads for that in telly now, have you? where you ask somebody to smile at you and you can see one side of their face drooping or if you hold their arms out and one of their arms starts to droop or starts to, to move or if they can't say a complicated sentence it means that the, the nerves that actually send a signal to innervate the tongue to, give a, to elicit a response aren't working so there's something wrong there so nowadays we recognize that pre-hospital and we can bypass a hospital to go to a stroke center and we do that sometimes. We might bypass the likes of Jane or Connolly Hospital in Blanchestown to go directly to the matter between certain areas because they have stroke teams on there all the time. So there's great improvements pre-hospital, really. I don't know if you can see the image of the, the picture there on the right. Can anyone tell me what that is? Yeah. Well, that would be the type of scene where we go to and you go into an apartment and you'd have somebody in respiratory arrest, needles all over the place, kind of bits of butts of cigarettes all over the place, and the place basically in, in bad order. So 
we do go to a lot of overdoses in Dublin and ODs. So we have to manage those patients as well. And that's where having the extra bodies comes in very, very handy. If you just have a two-person crew as part of an ambulance, actually managing somebody's airway, getting the defibrillator on to actually monitor the heart rate, and then move the patient and get them down four flights of stairs, because it's always usually in the top apartment that this happens, it can be quite hard to manage. So in Dublin Fire Brigade, we always call for, we'd send an appliance or a fire crew there as well. So we have somebody to help get oxygen to the patient. We have someone to help with the defibrillation or carry our defibrillators. We have someone to help lift the, the, the person or the patient down four flights of stairs. And it means we can get them to the hospital in, in much better time. So it's a very efficient way of working, really. Other well, patients, I mentioned it earlier, we deal with a lot of hypothermia type patients. Not just from taking somebody out of the water, but if somebody is living in a house and they've got no heating, or if they, they don't look after themselves well, if they're alcoholics sometimes, they, they may not look after themselves well. In a lot of cases, we're called to very impoverished areas where there'll be a lot of people wouldn't have taken care of themselves. And when we actually take their body temperature, they're hypothermic. And if somebody is very, very hypothermic, they require, require careful handling because they can have cardiac arrhythmias or funny heart rhythms if you, if you handle them too roughly. So it, it really does help having extra bodies on scene for that as well. Okay. Some of the more uh, juicy stuff that we go to, I don't know if you think it's juicy or not, but um, I know when, when our young lads come in, our new young recruits, they want to get out and see all the trauma that's going on and get, get experience with trauma. It's, it's something that I don't like to see now as much. I'm quite happy never to see any trauma again in my life. But um, unfortunately, it does happen. And the type of cause that we go to in Dublin, we go to the shootings. Um, I've been at a couple of gangland type, type shootings. In fact, when myself and Martin um, did some training in the States a couple of years ago, we spent a year over there working in, and we did some internships in Brooklyn and the Bronx. But when we came back here to Dublin, there have been kind of a lot more of these type shooting incidents that we would have seen over there even. And that's, I suppose, the, a sign of the times, really, isn't it? Um, a lot of uh, external hemorrhage we control very, very well pre-hospital. We have to be able to recognise the signs of shock. So you can have, be able to recognise external blood loss, but you have to be also able to recognise the signs of internal blood loss. In other words, we'd take someone's vital signs and we use them as a baseline to establish how the patient's doing. And then subsequent sets of vital signs we take, we monitor them very, very closely to see if the patient's improving or deteriorating. And that's one of our, our key skills, that our assessment skills pre-hospital are vital. So our guys are very, very good at taking pulses, taking blood pressures, auscultating and listening to breath sounds, especially in trauma where the possibility of a collapsed lung and a patient breathing can deteriorating. And how we manage that's very, very important. Um, so they're the types of uh, trauma incidents we come across. We, we do carry, I don't know if you're aware of it, but turn, the use of tourniquets has been kind of abandoned for the last few years. And now it's back on the agenda again. So if you have somebody with a, a massive uncontrollable bleed externally. We now use uh, special tourniquets that are very, very quick to apply and we can control hemorrhage very, very quickly. Um, we manage spinal injuries very, very well pre-hospital. We use uh, spinal boards and because we can have seven or eight people on scene, we can, we're very well practiced in log rolling and placing somebody on a spinal board as well. Limb fractures, we carry vacuum splints now that we can apply on somebody if they're having a limb fracture and that will immobilize the limb. And by immobilizing the limb, you're doing a couple of different things. You're stopping further damage. You're hopefully helping control any bleeds as well. And you're reducing pain and further injury. So these are all things that we do pre-hospital. And we manage traumatic cardiac arrests as well. Now, usually if somebody is in a vehicle like this where there's a high-speed impact head-on, and they're in cardiac arrest as a result of that type of injury, the outcome isn't that good. So a lot of the times we know that we go to scene and there's massive trauma 
and massive speed that's been involved, and the patient is in cardiac arrest. We'll get them off scene as quickly as possible. There'll be no playing around. We, log, we take them out of the vehicle very, very quickly, start working on the control hemorrhage, and straight to the A&E, because there's nothing we can do pre-hospital. What they need is bright lights and cold steel. In other words, they need to be on an operating theatre to have any chance of survival. So our job is to recognise that and to, to help with the treatment of it. Okay. I mentioned some of the advanced airways. We've got just one or two pictures of them here. Um, this is what we call a supraglottic airway. And if somebody's got no breathing at all, we insert this into the airway, and it forms a seal around the, <coughs> the, the entrance of the trachea or the glottic opening. And it means then we can get 100% oxygen into them. There's another um, picture there where we'd intubate someone. What we do is we put a laryngoscope into the airway. The laryngoscope has a light on it. And this is what we visualize. We visualize the airway, and we pass a breathing tube through the vocal cords here. And when the breathing tube gets passed into the vocal cords, there's nothing other than 100% oxygen get in there. So they've got a very secured airway. So if the patient vomits and they're in cardiac arrest, it means we can manage the airway very, very well. Um, the access that I mentioned as well, we get IV intravenous access, so we, we pick a vein, we put on a tourniquet, it engorges blood in the vein, we put a, a cannula in, and then we can give a range of medications depending on the patient's condition. And the other way, if somebody is in shock and their vessels have closed right down, and they're, if their veins are very, very flat and we can't get a vein, we don't waste any time. We have a, an attempt or two at getting IV access, and then we drill directly into the bone. So we have a, a, what we call an intraosseous gun, and we landmark just on the top part of the shin, we drill straight in, and we've got va vascular access where we can give all our medications. So things have kind of come on a little bit pre-hospital now. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but um, basically this, this is the range of medications we can give pre-hospital. So for most conditions, we have medications we can give that will benefit patients. So, Kevin. Thank you very much. Well, we first came down because we've seen the pre-hospital care um, for the fire brigade. And we're in Navin Red Cross, so we're EMTs who are interested in pre-hospital emergency care. I'm a member of the Red Cross. Came here this evening for one of the lectures done by Dublin Fire Brigade. Uh, we have a keen interest in pre-hospital emergency care. Very good, it was very interesting, great insight into how Dublin Fire Brigade would work as opposed to the HSE in general. It was good to see someone else's perspective from emergency care other than what we see as a voluntary role. Absolutely. I mean, we put down just to really come and see the Dublin Fire Brigade one, and we stayed on then for the infertility. And I, did, I personally took an awful lot away from it, like, and I'd be interested in the next in the series of lectures. <laughs>